Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro and I'm a Portfolio Analyst with Tricom Funding. As a financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member in the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider Webinar Series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenter today is Alan Gilbert. Alan is a business development executive with Essential Staff Care, a division of Insurance Applications Group, LLC. Alan is responsible for business development of Essential Staff Care's fixed amenity benefits plans to staffing firms throughout the U.S. Alan also serves as AIG's liaison for several state staffing associations and corporate partners. Alan has made dozens of presentations to different groups regarding the impact of ACA on the staffing industry and truly enjoys being an ACA subject matter expert resource for his clients and prospects. Alan has over 25 years of experience in the professional services field, including several years in the staffing industry. He holds a double major in business administration and insurance economic securities from the University of South Carolina and is a South Carolina licensed health, life and health agent. Many of us in the staffing industry breathe a sigh of relief when the IRS delayed the employer responsibility provision until 2015. The IRS has released final regulations which call upon employers to make some critical decisions in the months ahead. In today's webinar, our guest speaker, Alan, will share some information on ACA strategies to reduce your staffing firm's tax implications, including the minimum essential coverage update, the future of ACA, a multi-year ACA strategy, and ACA analytics and reporting. By the end of the session, you should have the information you need to prepare your staffing firm for the impending imp implementation of the employer mandate. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the chat feature located on the right toolbar. There will be time for your questions at the end. And there will also be time for a poll to give us your feedback on um, today's presentation and, and any other future topics that you may be interested in. With that, I will turn the floor over to Alan. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I first want to start by thanking everyone for taking time out of what I know are busy schedules to uh, to attend today's webinar. Um, as Amanda pointed out, we um, we do a lot of these. Uh, we certainly don't profess to have all the answers, but I think we have a firm understanding of uh, the options that are available to staffing firms, and uh, that's where we're going to spend most of our time today. I'm not going to go back and spend a lot of time on some of the you know, ACA 101s, if you will. Um, but I'm going to go through some slides. And I guess the first thing that we have to get um, disclosed is the fact that we're licensed insurance professionals. We're not uh, tax advisors. We're not lawyers. We are insurance sales folks. Um, I think we have a pretty darn good understanding of, of how this law is going to impact our clients and prospects, but the fact still remains that you need to consult with your own uh, legal counsel and, and tax advisors as to how uh, your participation in this program could in fact impact your firm. Um, many of you, I'm sure, have attended previous uh, Essential Staff Care webinars, and we thank you for that. Um, those webinars are still available on our website. Uh, on the main page in the upper right-hand corner, there's a web, a healthcare reform tab. If you click on that, it'll take you to pre -re or recordings of all the previous sessions we've done. Um, I don't, I don't know if I'd recommend going back to one or two, but certainly if you need some refreshers on the look back and what constitutes a variable hour employee and so forth, um, listening to three, four, and five might be of benefit to you. Um, today's agenda, as Amanda pointed out, uh, we're really going to focus most of our attention on strategy. Um, I was fortunate last week to spend a few days in Washington, D.C. at the American Staffing Association Annual Law Conference. And um, 
certainly it, it gives me the, a face-to-face opportunity to talk with uh, folks that are in your shoes, uh, discuss the kind of challenges that uh, they face, and, and, and talk through in very uh, real terms uh, what some of these strategies might mean in terms of, uh, of options for them. So today's, um, I'll give you just a brief, very brief overview, and, and these slides I'm sure will be made available. Is that correct, Amanda, that you will be able to forward this presentation to others at the end? Yes, I can do that. Okay, perfect. So, I, you know, we're the leading provider of health care benefits to the staffing industry. We have over 1,000 staffing companies implemented on our our uh, fixed indemnity product, as you as this slide depicts, we've been you know we've been fortunate to be recognized. I think the one thing that we're most uh, proud of is our uh, the Inc. 5,000 fastest growing companies, and and the, to to be able to do that year after year after year is is uh, is quite a feat, I think. Um, some idea as to where our client concentration is located today, um, and. Then let's from there. Let's go on to um, you know really w- just the the basic play or pay strategy. And in, in at a glance, um, of course, this slide does need some. You know, this was a standard slide until some changes w- recently occurred. But if you're a large employer, and that definition, of course, now has changed uh, for 2015. For you're a large employer if you have greater than 100 full-time employees on payroll. Um, if you're a large employer on December 31st, 2014, you will be a large employer for the entire year of 2015. And of course, the converse is also true. If you're less than 100 full-time employees on payroll uh, on January or December 31st, 2014, you will be a small pl- uh, employer uh, for the entire year of 2015. So regardless of what happens during the year, it's a one-year um, designation, if you will. Um, the choices essentially are pretty simple. You can either offer an MEC or a minimal essential coverage product. Uh, if you choose not to offer something, you're going to pay a $2,000 penalty assessed at $166 a month on all full-time employees minus the first 80. That that also has changed from 30 to 80, so I want you to make note of that. Of course, the other option would be to offer a MEC, a minimal essential coverage plan, to all of those full-time employees. And then the question becomes, does this plan meet minimum value um, or is it affordable? If it doesn't meet those, it could potentially trigger a B penalty. We'll get a lot more into uh, that discussion, but essentially if you don't offer a minimum value plan or if it's not affordable, you know, you, you sus- leave yourself susceptible to someone going to the exchange, receiving a subsidy, and that would essentially trigger the, the B penalty or the 250 a month for a collected penalty of $3,000 for the year. If you offer a minimum value plan that is, in fact, affordable, uh, by merely offering that plan, you would have no penalty at all. The challenge becomes that those plans are – their availability of those plans for staffing companies are, are, are relatively tight right now. Um, there's, there were a couple things that occurred recently. Um, there was a recent delay that came out announcing that insurance plans that do not meet the ACA requirements continue can continue uh, to be offered um, for an unsp- unspecified period of time. Uh, that was something that ironically was thrown out, I think, in the last month or two, um, ironically, just before a midterm election. But the problem with that is uh, just because the administration says these plans can be sold, it is ultimately up to the insurance commissioners in the various states. And most of those commissioners have opted not to allow non-complying ACA plans to uh, to be continued to be sold. Um, there was also some, as I mentioned earlier, um, the full-time employer uh, calculation moved from thir- from 50 or more to 100 or more. Uh, that was uh, one recent change. Uh, they also, uh, it, it, in that initial law, it said that you had to make a offering to 95% of those eligible employees. That has been delayed now until 2016. Uh, for 2015, you'll need to offer a minimal essential coverage plan to at least 70% of your full-time eligible employees. Um, so there was a little bit, little bit of relaxation, if you will, in the compliance requirements there. Um, the break-in-service rule also got changed. Uh, originally, that break-in-service rule basically says that if you have an employee on payroll and you are 
uh, utilizing the look-back rule on those employees. Uh, previously, it said that if the employee was absent from your work for, for 26 weeks, uh, you could essentially restart the clock, if you will. Uh, that rule has now been reset to 13 weeks, but that only applies for those employees that you're hiring in 2015. Um, and so if they miss 13 weeks, you could have essentially reset the clock on the look-back rule. Um, you know, one of the greatest challenges I think that staffing companies are going to have is not so much identifying the ongoing employees, the ones that are currently on payroll in 2014. I think it's going to be very easy for you, most of you, to identify uh, which employees are in fact qualified as full-time employees, and thus you would have to provide a offering of a minimal essential coverage product. I think that's easy for the ongoing. I think the real challenge is going to be in 2015 when you're hiring new employees, and the law very specifically says that at time of hire, you must make a determination at that time whether this person is in fact a variable or a non-variable hour employee. The look-back rule can only be applied to variable hour employees. So there was some, uh, th there was some additional clarification uh, in, in February of this year that provided uh, some additional guidance around uh, you know, this, this idea of who's variable, who's non-variable. In my opinion, that continues to be uh, somewhat nebulous and uh, very difficult, I think, for most staffing companies to identify. Um, but um, I could also, Amanda, provide a slide presentation that was provided by ASA that specifically gives some examples um, of uh, actual examples that the IRS has given that may very well make those kind of determinations uh, a lot easier. So I will also include that in what I, uh, what you could potentially send out to attendees of our of our uh, webinar today. Oh, that's fantastic! Gonna, Thank you. Yeah, and, and and you know, it's one thing to read a a, a guidance or a a sentence that says something. I'll go back here. Um, in in that in that uh, recent uh, analysis or guidance, it, it talks about they gave four examples that could help you determine if someone is a non-variable hour or variable hour. And I've read it probably 25 times, and I still uh, it, they don't go into the extent of the detail that I would like. For instance, um, they don't tell you that all four must be met. Uh, they don't say that three of the four must be met. <laughs> you know, they leave it very open. So, for instance, some of the litmus tests they give is, does the employee have the right to reject an assignment? Well, I would think everybody could pretty much feel that most of their employees have the right to reject an assignment, so you could kind of check that one off. Are there going to be periods where no offer of placement is made? Yeah, I think, you know, that you could probably check that one off. Um are offered placements for different periods of time? Mm, now you're starting to, you know, it depends on if you're hiring for a specific client. So that gets a little, you know, has it been typically offered placements that do not extend beyond 13 weeks? This 13-week period seems to be kind of a length of time. If something's less than 13 weeks, it's probably variable hour. If it's in greater than 13-week periods, maybe it's, you know, you have less of a uh, argument for saying that person's variable hour. But the one thing the law very specifically states, and this is where I would allow, I would allow this to guide my decision. It talks a great deal about facts and circumstances regarding the assignment. So, for instance, if you're assigning Johnny to the XYZ company, and the facts and circumstances associated with the last 200 placements you've made at the XYZ company are that those people go to work, and they work 40 hours or plus a week, and they work for, for some undetermined period of time, I think the facts and circumstances surrounding that assignment would be difficult for you to defend that that's in fact variable, because it doesn't appear to be variable. It, depends, it, it, it appears to be a non-variable hour. So I, you know, I think there's certainly going to be some additional guidance in this area, but I just wanted to point that out. But in the examples I will give to Amanda, I think – uh, it's one thing to see a, a sentence, but it's yet another when the IRS actually issues something that says, you know, here's some examples. So I'll make sure that she gets that for distribution. So we're, now we're going to switch gears a little bit because this is where I want most of our conversation to be today, is around the subject of st 
strategy, and before we really can get into strategy, we really got to talk about, you know, let's get some some basic terms defined. The law says that you must offer minimal essential coverage to your employees in order to get over the A penalty. Um, and again, you would only may have to make this offering to your qualified full-time employees. Um, a, a minimal essential coverage, that, that term, um, really describes more about where the employer the employee is getting coverage and 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 means a, a great deal less as it relates to what level of coverage is being provided so don't think about minimal essential coverage necessarily as being a, a certain type of plan but rather it's where they're getting their plan from and and, and what they're specifically referencing are employer sponsored ERISA qualified plans so the for purpose for the for the purposes of tax minimal essential coverage means any group employer plan health plan except and you can see all those things that that are listed as exceptions so anything that's offered as a group insurance plan with the exception of uh, accident policies long term care dental vision uh, fixed indemnity products all of those plans are referred to as accepted plans. So those plans are specifically excluded from ACA. They don't meet the guidelines. They're purposefully accepted. The one thing that you don't see as one of the accepted benefits in that list is wellness and preventive plans. So we're going to come back to that in just a few minutes. Um, minimum value um, determines whether an employee actually gets a subsidy or not. And the minimum value plans are not to be confused with minimal essential coverage. Minimal value plans specifically refer to plans that have 60% actuarial value, and that's an insurance measure on the amount of benefits that are paid, paid by the plan. And But the, the, like, the more likely way to, or the easier way to interpret in your mind what a minimum value plan is, think about those plans as being the bronze plans that are being offered through the exchanges. The bronze plans are, in fact, those plans that meet the bare minimum 60% actuarial value. And it's, it's, it's whether an employer offers a minimum value plan or not, that ultimately will determine if someone, one of your employees, can, in fact, get a subsidy uh, through the exchange. So we'll actually talk a little bit more about that. Um, we, we'll also talk a good bit about the the idea of what's affordable when when the when the law says that a minimum value plan must be also it needs to be a 60% actuarial value and it also must be uh affordable to your employees and that it, by definition is their contribution the employee's contribution cannot exceed 9.5% of their W2 wages so um those are some of the basic um guidelines that we'll use as we consider some of these other concepts. Now, a year or so ago, um, 16 months or so ago, uh, we learned of this concept, um, and, and I, I don't know if I can necessarily track back where it originated, but some really, uh, you know, really smart ERISA attorneys and people that were very familiar with existing ERISA law began making comparisons between existing ERISA laws and the new ACA. And they began connecting dots and, and, and making some inferences. And what they concluded was a wellness and preventive plan uh, is considered a, a group, you know, employer health plan under ERISA laws. Um, and initially there was some, you know, well, maybe maybe this does rise to the level of minimal essential coverage. You know, our concern initially was that it certainly didn't appear to meet the spirit of the law. Uh, because I think we all agreed that, you know, the law and what it was intended to be saying was that employers needed to provide a, quote, major medical minimum value plan. But nevertheless, um, you know, we remained skeptical for a number of months. And then after getting some additional confirmation from Ed Lenz and, and Alden Bianchi with the American Staff Association, talking with our own legal counsel, um, we concluded that, mm, yeah, yeah, that, Yep, this certainly does appear to, to rise to the level of minimal essential coverage, these wellness and preventive plans. So as I as I continue to um, spell this, this strategy out, I do want to point out that 
uh, HHS, uh, Health and Human Services, while we uh, requested for uh, clarification, um, and and verbally they will say, yeah, that that certainly appears to be a plan that would satisfy this, uh, you know, the, the this requirement of MEC. They have failed to put that in writing. Um, so, you know, while everyone I think agrees that this strategy could work, how long it will work, I don't know. Um, but it appears that will be a, a, a workable strategy at least for 2015. Um, essential staff care as well as other companies have created these plans. Uh, these plans tend to be self-funded uh, in order to avoid any state mandates because what these wellness and preventive plans are doing is they're addressing a very specific list of 23 federally, excuse me, 63 federally mandated wellness and preventive uh, benefits and and they're broken into three different groups: uh, adults, women, and children. So there's very specific uh, screening, uh, counseling type of benefits that are all centered around this concept of of wellness. Um, but but please keep in mind these plans are are just that: screening, counseling. Um, they essentially provide little or nothing in the way of, of treatment of an illness once it's been identified, um, but it does c provide things like contraception, uh, mammograms, um, various kinds of cholesterol screening, all these kinds of screening and, um, and, and, and other type of wellness uh, measurements, if you will. Um, let's move on to the next slide. Examples of some of these wellness plans I talked a little bit about just a moment ago, but um, in 2015, the concept is that a wellness and preventive plan is expected to eliminate the $2,000 A penalty on all full-time employees by simply offering a wellness and preventive plan. By offering a wellness and preventive plan to your full-time employees on payroll, by merely offering it, you would be avoiding the $2,000 penalty on all full-time employees. However, because these plans do not rise to the level of minimum value, which are those major medical insurance plans I described earlier, what it does is it leaves the potential or possibility of one of your full-time employees, in fact, going to a state or federal exchange, applying for a qualified plan, and if, in fact, they obtain a subsidy, that would trigger what's called the B penalty, which is a $3,000 penalty back to you, assessed at a 250, a rate of $250 per month. Hmm. So it, while it gets you over the A penalty, the 2,000 on all full time, it does leave you potentially susceptible to someone going to the exchange, receiving a subsidy, triggering the B penalty. Um, no employer will be assessed the B penalty if an employee does not receive a federal subsidy. So before we leave the screen, I want to just introduce the concept of, let's say you had an employee that's a relatively low-wage employee that, in fact, desired to go and get a ACA-compliant plan through either a federal or state exchange. Through the process of qualifying for that program, uh, if they meet certain guidelines, they may very well could be identified as being eligible for Medicaid, at which point they would be redirected to Medicaid and if that were to occur, there would not be a $3,000 penalty because the employee would not have ever received a federal subsidy, but rather they would have been redirected to Medicaid for coverage. So getting redirected to Medicaid does not trigger the $3,000 penalty. So as each of you are thinking about your mix of employees on your payroll and whether you're in a state that has expanded Medicaid or not expanded Medicaid, these are the kinds of considerations that you need to take into account when you're truly trying to assess what kind of exposure there really is to you. So with that, having uh, concerns about wellness plans. Um, again, the one thing that we're really straightforward with our clients about is um, while this appears to be a, a workable strategy and one that could quite frankly be one of the most cost-effective strategies for our clients, it's certainly not without some um, concerns. Uh, there's there's this concept about you know this actuarial certification. Um, you know we feel comfortable that 
the plans that we've developed, and I'm sure that those that others that have designed these plans have gone through the necessary steps to ensure that they are actuarially certified as wellness and preventive plans. So, uh, but obviously, you'd want to make sure that whoever you're buying this product from, that that they they you know crossed their T's and dotted their I's. The other concern is, could this be a short-lived solution? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we've had a difficult time getting anything in writing directly from HHS, Treasury, or, um, or, or or the IRS. But verbally, they will state, yes, those plans do appear to satisfy, and I can see where you guys arrive at that. Um, but, but again, this could be a short-lived strategy. We feel confident that it's going to be good for 15, but how much beyond that, I, 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 I can't say. Um, I think we have a couple things that are at work that are working in our favor. Um, I think that uh, b the midterm elections later this year uh, will be the reason why uh, not a great deal of additional changes will be made to ACA, um, because uh, uh, the, the, you know the, the, no, the administration certainly doesn't want uh, uh, any other uh, new backlash, if you will, from ACA to impact the the midterms. And once we get beyond the midterms, of course, you know, whether we like it or not, I think the majority of 15 and 16 are going to be uh, clearly focused on the next presidential race. The question then becomes is, you know, do they really want to kill a strategy like this that could potentially impact uh, literally thousands of business owners in the segment of industry of, of staffing if they were to do away with this strategy? So, uh, you know, more to come. Uh, stay aware. We certainly will advise people as we learn. Uh, as I mentioned, the self-funded plans, the reason why these wellness plans are self-funded is to avoid individual state mandates. Um, because they are self-funded ERISA plans, they only have to adhere to federally mandated benefits. So it, by having it self-funded, it avoids the state. I talked a little bit about that. Um, and uh, let's see, underwriting administrative issues. Um, it, you know, it's okay for full-time. It's questionable for part-time. Uh, do you really want to offer a benefit plan that is going to be, by the way, these are monthly premiums uh, or attachment points. You refer to attachment points when you're talking self-funded. But uh, the fact is these are not going to be like your fixed indemnity products that you're familiar with today that have weekly payroll deductions. These are going to be monthly list bill plans. So you, I think you would clearly want to focus the offering of these kinds of plans to your full-time employees and not your part-time because of the, the potential um, billing reconciliation and if somebody only works three of the four weeks, yeah, you know, how's it going to work? You know, so I would suggest limiting this to your full-time um, because really those are the ones that by offering it, you're going to be achieving this uh, uh, essentially a tax strategy that we talked about. Um, going forward, it, 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 you can offer these things, these plans, these wellness and preventive plans. Um, uh, we are offering it one of two different ways. I can't speak to how all companies uh, in this industry are, are, are offering these plans, but we are offering these plans to our clients as, as one of two different ways. You can offer these minimal essential wellness and preventive plans as a voluntary plan. What voluntary means by definition is that an employee, if they want it, they voluntarily purchase it and they pay for it. So let's talk about if you offered a wellness and preventive plan on a voluntary strategy, uh, what, are the, what are the implications? Well, you can rest assured that you will have relatively low enrollment. Uh, by, by default, you would also then have relatively high exposure to the B-tax. Um, there would be no cost to the employer. There's the there's the good news. You could offer this as a voluntary plan at no cost to you. Um, uh, relatively low low value because again I mentioned these plans pay for a very specific list of of, of benefits. Uh, it costs roughly sixty five to seventy dollars a month depending on a, a couple different factors, uh, census data, whether you want stop loss coverage included. Um, it covers screening and prevention. As I mentioned, there's really no essential health care benefits like treatment, doctor visits, you know, in-hospital stay. None of that is covered in these wellness plans. It would require very extensive disclosure because there's going to be um, 
there's going to be some impact on employees that, in fact, enroll in these plans. Um, HHS could clarify this option away, if you will, uh, leaving employers with the uh, struggle to make any kind of change in strategy. But for right now, we feel fairly confident that uh, this is a strategy that is workable for 2015. Um, so before we leave this page, I want to just uh, hit home two points. If you offer a wellness and preventive plan as a voluntary plan, you're going to have relatively low enrollment and high exposure to B, but there would be no cost to you. Okay. With that in mind, I want to switch now to another strategy that you might consider, and that is offering the plan as an employer-paid benefit. If you were to offer this plan as an employer-paid benefit, that means that you would be paying the monthly premium, and you would be offering this as an employer-paid benefit to those full-time qualified employees that are on your payroll. If you were to do that, I think we could all agree that you would have relatively high enrollment because, generally speaking, people don't turn down stuff that's free. Um, we would have to have very clear disclosure that talks about um, – you know, as an employee of the XYZ company and a full-time and qualified employee, um, your employer has chosen to offer you a minimal essential coverage wellness and preventive plan. Uh, by you accepting this plan, uh, you would be satisfying your individual mandate requirement. So you would, in fact, be helping your employees to uh, avoid their individual tax penalties. So that's, that's a positive. Um, but one of the things that I want to really – make sure that everyone clearly understands that as long as someone is enrolled in a MEC plan, the employee cannot receive a subsidy. So if you enroll an employee, if you offer this as an employer-paid benefit, um, you could expect high enrollment. You would expect, therefore, you would have lower exposure to the B penalty because as long as an employee is enrolled in the MEC plan, the employee cannot receive a subsidy. Now, an employee could, in fact, opt out of this benefit offering at the time of offering. So when you rolled this out to your full-time employees and explained to them what the plan does and what it doesn't do and what it covers and what it doesn't cover, um, through very clear disclosure, they would have the choice to say, mm, you know, I don't want this. So they could opt out at the time of offering as well as they could disenroll during the year. In either of those cases, because they would no longer be, or in the case of opting out at the time of offering, they would have never enrolled, therefore they would be free to go to the exchange and apply for an exchange-qualified plan and, and potentially receive a subsidy. But as long as they are enrolled in the MEC plan, they cannot receive a subsidy. So I'll, I'm going to leave that just for a second to, to kind of let you think about that because there's a, there's a subtlety there for between offering this plan voluntarily where you'd have low enrollment and high exposure to be, but if you offer it as an employer-paid plan, you should expect to have higher enrollment even with the substantial uh, disclosure comments would have to be made. If you have a high enrollment, you should have low exposure, a lower, for sure, exposure to the B penalty because as long as someone's enrolled, they can't receive a subsidy. So they, therefore, by definition, they can't trigger a B. These, penal, these, uh, these premiums or these attachment points would be tax-deductible business expense, uh, again, roughly $70 a month. Um, cover screening, as I mentioned, could clarify away. We'll keep you posted. But you know, there's the the subtle difference between how an employer can choose to implement a wellness and preventive plan, whether it's voluntarily or an employer paid. As I understand it, there are some companies out there that are not offering these plans in a, on a voluntary basis, but rather as um, as a uh, as only an employer-paid benefit. So just keep that in mind. So 
I'm leaving the wellness and preventive strategy. We can certainly come back to that and answer any questions you might have. But uh, a thorough discussion of your options would would not be would not be complete if we also didn't talk about uh, another uh, potential strategy. And I say potential. And there's a number of reasons why I use that word. But uh, a minimum value plan. Um, these minimum value plans, again, as I mentioned earlier, think about them as being the bronze plans on the exchanges. This is clearly what HHS meant with regards to a target or a, a target floor of benefits. They, they, the, the law, I think the spirit of the law was that uh, large employers should be required to offer a minimum value plan. And, and it was only this, quote, loophole, if you will, uh, that was discovered that brought about this wellness and preventive strategy. But uh, by definition, minimum value MAC plans uh, cover 60% of the average population's medical claims. That's that 60% actuarial uh, plan that I mentioned to you or that, that insurance evaluation uh, concept. Um, it gets the employer over both A and B penalty as long as you're offering a minimum value plan and it is affordable to your employees. And again, the affordability test uh, only has to apply to the individual plan that you offer to your employee. Um, you do not have to uh, make, quote, the, 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 the offering of coverage uh, affordable to his dependents. Uh, it only has to be affordable to your employee. And that affordability test, again, is he or she, your employee, doesn't, cannot contribute greater than 9.5% of their wages in the way of an employee contribution to this plan. Um, <clears throat> so if you offered a 60% actuarial plan and made it affordable to your employees, you would essentially be getting past both the A and the B penalty without a question. Okay? But there is there's a couple little, there's some, there's some downfalls to this. By offering affordable minimum value plan, an employee and their family member would not be able to receive subsidies. It's called the family glitch, and that is very clear in the law. So whether your employee takes your minimum value plan or not, accepts it, declines it, it doesn't matter. If you're offering a minimum value plan and making it affordable, the employee nor their family members would be able to receive a subsidy through the exchange. Hmm. When I've when I pose that to clients and prospects I've talked about, I get mixed reactions. Um, some reactions are, I don't care. Uh, you know, I'm just following the law. Hmm, okay, well, that's true. You're, you're, you, the law says if you offer a minimum value plan and make it affordable, you've done what you have to do. You've, you've complied with the law. The problem is, are you truly doing a disservice to your employee? And what I mean by that is, if you have relatively low-wage employees, who, who better to benefit from a, a new program like this than low-wage employees that could, in fact, go to the exchange and would clearly qualify for federal subsidy? But by you offering this plan, this minimum value affordable plan, you have essentially barred your employees and their family members from receiving these subsidies. And while you might say, I don't care, um, that may be different. Your, your opinion of that may be different if if Johnny finds his way to the 7 o'clock news and he's standing outside of one of your clients talking to investigative reporter from Channel News Denver and says, you know, uh, I work for the XYZ company and those rascals, they're offering me a minimum volume plan that they know that I can't afford. And, and you know, by them doing that, my family and see my wife here and my two little kids, we can't get a subsidy from the federal government. I'm not suggesting that would happen. But I certainly wouldn't want it to happen outside of my staffing company. So um, uh, just something to think about. Um, but but let's get to the real let's get to the real the real life issue here. Um, uh, insurance companies are not scrambling; uh, they're not beating each other over the head to try to get to uh, offering minimal value plans to this industry called the staffing industry. Um, and, and they're not doing so for a number of very, very good reasons. Um, and, and, and the main reason I'm going to focus on it is the, the, the conversation that I've had a hundred times if I've had it once. 
uh, I talk to a staffing company owner and I say, well, let me ask you, what would you like? What would you, what's your perfect solution here? And they say, well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get us a fully insured, major medical, minimum value plan. I want you to make it affordable to my employees. And then I'm going to offer it, and I'm going to hope nobody will take it. So I let that sit for a second, and then I say to myself, and then ultimately to the person who just made the comment, I say, you have precisely identified why the insurance industry is not rushing to find solutions. Because what you just said was you want them to expel, you know, expend industry resources, designing plans that when they're offered, the buyer of that plan hopes no one will buy it. Why would an insurance company do that? Why would an insurance company develop a plan that the person they're intending to sell it through, i.e. through the staffing company to the employees, is in hopes that no one will take it? So you're beginning to understand why, I mean, and that's just the, the overall, but I can point to three distinct reasons why insurance companies are not scrambling to insure an industry that they have historically not underwritten. And it, it's three major aspects of the law. The very first one is group private health insurance as of January, 14, January 1st, 2014, there are no more annual nor lifetime limits on claims. The sky's the limit. Whereas insurance plans used to have annual limits, the insurance company would pay up to X, and then after that they would stop paying, those limits are gone. Insurance companies are on the hook for every single claim that comes in, whether it comes in in one year or over the lifetime of the policy. There is no limit to exposure to liability. I'll let that sink in for a second. And then on top of that, they said, in the past, you had certain uh, participation requirements. In order to have a group health insurance plan, if you had 70, or if you had 100 uh, eligible employees under the old rules, a carrier might say, in order for this to be a valid plan, I have to have 75% participation. And that participation, while it, an unknowing person looking at that might say, well, gee, that seems unrealistic. It's really not because it's the only way insurance companies were able to spread the risk associated with sick people versus healthy people. By having good participation, they were able to distribute that risk. The requirements of participation have been taken out. Insurance companies can no longer require a certain level of participation. And then third, and this one is just as hard-hitting, there's an aspect of the law that says that, in, that a group health insurance plan must pay out 85% of premiums collected in claims, and it's called an 85% loss ratio. Insurance companies must pay 85%, 85 cents of every dollar they take in, in claims. If they do not spend 85 cents on claims of every dollar, they have to refund whatever they don't spend, refund to the insured, leaving the remaining 15% to run their businesses, IT, marketing, administration, salaries, bonuses, commissions, 15% is what's left. Wow, um, that's tough. Um, let's hope the insurance or hope the government never steps into staffing companies and says, hey, this whole industry as of January 1st, 2015 must operate on a X profit margin. Let's hope that never happens. Um, but, but that's what we're dealing with. So obviously quoting has become a very, very difficult, um, a very difficult thing for insurance companies. Um, to write an industry they have historically not ever written before. Are there some plans out there available? Yes, there are. Uh, they tend to be uh, plans that are designed for very large populations. Um, uh, for instance, you know, we we have a, a partner that, that will allow us to offer fully insured plans to staffing companies, but they must have 3,000 people on payroll. Um, they, you know, so, I mean, the business rules become um, pretty daunting for a lot of companies. There are self-funded minimum value plans out there. Um, we continue to work on uh, the, 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 the idea of offering a, uh, a, a self-funded minimum value plan. Um, but, but again, there's a lot of issues regarding 
major medical self-funding for all the reasons I just talked about, not to mention just the, the unlimited claims exposure. Even with stop-loss coverage, which you wouldn't want to have a self-funded major medical plan without stop-loss coverage, um, even that would only cover you to a certain point, and once they once you know you, once your claims blew through that, if they did, you would be on the financial hook for that. Um, we've had some recent conversations with our friends at Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and since the beginning of this year, this is a very interesting point to think about. Um, they are receiving million dollar plus claims at an unprecedented rate, the likes they had never seen before, and it it all has to do with. The healthcare providers in America know that insurance companies must pay the claims. So, why don't you make hay while the sun's still shining? So, uh, you know, we sense our partners at Blue Cross. We've heard the same thing from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Georgia. Uh, these insurance companies are getting claims at a rate that exceed one million dollars at a rate they have never seen before, and it's because I think. Um, Tell healthcare providers recognize they can bill whatever they what they basically feel like billing. To give you some idea of what these uh, these minimum value plan, I want to save some. I'm not going to go into this, but you, I think everybody knows that these plans are going to have high deductibles. They're going to have high out of pocket expenses. There's going to be large copayments um, because they're 60% value um, by definition, and and that, the only way you can get to a 60% actuarial value plan is to have a plan that doesn't cover some of the benefits. So um, there's going to be significant out-of-pocket exposure uh, on these plans. Um, pricing structures, insurance companies are now looking at quoting industries that previously have been on a decline list, decline list, that's the staffing industry. Uh, new pricing structures include no minimum participation requirements. I talked to you about that. Uh, reasons why underwriting concerns. Yeah, you know, there's no prior claims history. Don't know who will enroll. You know, there's <laughs> the list goes on and on. There's uh, uh, insurance companies are not racing to offer minimum value plans to the staffing industry. They're just not. Um, th that's a good chart. Th th this actually shows you how, um, depending upon the state you're in, uh, the federal poverty level, what the earnings are, what the penalties are for. For 14, this doesn't include because they do go up in 15. Um, but what the penalty would be for someone making $16,755 would be $168. Uh, the average plan cost is, you know, that if they went through the exchange, got a subsidy, you know, their cost would be somewhere around, you know, $625, $627. Government subsidy would kick in about 3335 so you can see how these plans are are being heavily subsidized. Um, let's let's talk about where we think it's going from now, uh, from here. Um, we think it's highly unlikely this bill is going to be repealed or replaced with a new law or new regulations. Certainly, no likelihood of any changes between now and the midterms. Will we potentially see something in 15? I guess anything's possible at this point. Um, more likely, uh, there will be an eventual replacement of private health insurance to a single-payer system or a version of it. Um, most likely, the bill will continue to be amended or fixed, so employers will continue to scramble to, to comply. Um, the compliance burden of, these, uh, of this uh, will probably drive more, employ more employers to opt out and simply pay the tax. Um, there was a recent study done on S&P 500 companies, and a, a study was done that said that if, if, if the Fortune 500 companies in America opted out of offering major medical, they could save in excess of $700 billion in the next 10 years. That's a lot of money. And more and more companies around this country, in our opinion, will be analyzing the escalation of their premiums and simply saying, no mas. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to get out of this. Um, I'm going to figure out if I have a $2,000 penalty if I don't offer a benefit plan to my employees and I'm currently spending $9,000 per employee on benefits, it doesn't take a rocket scientist or a CPA to determine that mm, it might be best for them to opt out. Now, what they will do to soften that blow of their employees being, you know, going to the exchanges, 
you know, I think there's a number of strategies employers might take to um, to soften that blow, if you will, allowing employees to, okay, we're no longer going to offer a major medical plan. You're going to get your catastrophic care through the exchanges. Oh, and by the way, as an employer benefit, we're going to pay for an increasing shift to defined contribution plans. Uh, that's where we think the industry, if it stays on its current path today, uh, more and more employers would uh, begin to opt out. So with that having been said, you've got to ask yourself this question. If employers in America who have historically offered major medical insurance to their employees are considering opting out, why would an employer in an industry that has never offered major medical plans consider to jump in? Why would a staffing company offer a minimum value plan when, in fact, those have historically offered it are considering getting out? Just something to think about. Um, so with that in mind, I want to leave some time. Um, a couple things we want to keep an eye on, the auto and rule. You know, we're keeping an eye on that for you. It's, it, it's something that if it ever got enforced, it would, it would be a kick, a hard one, to not just this industry, a lot of industries. So we're keeping a close eye on that, the auto and roll. Uh, I'm not going to go into this because I think everybody knows that while plan specs are important, the real important factor when you're considering what plan to do business with or what company is understand what they've done in the staffing industry and how have they successfully uh, administered plans that are currently being used in this industry. Because let's face it, uh, administering health insurance plans for the staffing industry are a great deal different than offering it to a traditional workforce that doesn't have 400% annual turnover. Um, so administration is the key, not plan design. Uh, Multi-year strategy, uh, track your employees, make sure that you have ways in place to make sure that you're identifying eligible employees when in fact they're eligible. Um, there's a number of software systems out there that are doing a great job. Uh, make sure you're tracking your employees, make sure you're closely watching it. Make sure that you have partners that can help you determine the best strategy for a pay or play. Um, and there is the outline of the ACA and Health and Human Services. I always love that slide because it's, it's so it, – it tells you why there's all these unintended consequences. And that's it. Any questions? Okay, so we have now opened the floor for questions. So go ahead and use um, the Q&A feature, the chat feature, and submit your questions. We do have one question that has come in already. Um, okay. Is there an 80% cutout for 2015 on the B tax also, or is the penalty charged from the first person who receives the subsidy? Yeah, it's, um, there's a, I think there's a couple things being asked here. Uh, the 80%... It, 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 that or excuse me, it's not actually eighty percent. It's the hard number eight zero. So, in the past, what the law said was, if you chose to opt out, in in other words, if you decide to simply pay the penalty, you're not going to offer an ACA compliant plan. You're going to pay the penalty. In the past, it was you got the first thirty employees for free, and you paid the two thousand dollar penalty on the balance. What the new provision, the recent change, was that that number moved from 30 to 80. It's not 80 percent. It's 80. So if you had 100, you'd have to have 100 full-time employees for this law to even apply to you. So let's say that you had 125 full-time employees. If you choose to do nothing, you're going to take 125 minus 80 and pay a penalty on 45 employees. Okay. I hope and that answered that question. Could you also then answer um, the question, I guess, regarding the B tax? So, mm -hmm. if they offered mm -hmm. a plan mm -hmm. and then some people decided not to take that plan and they went right. to the subsidy, That's then correct. you would be potentially eligible for the B tax on that employee who went to the subsidy? That that actually received one. That is correct. You, it would trigger the B penalty, the three thousand dollar penalty. Yes. And that would be on every single person who receives the subsidy. That is correct. Okay. But now, okay. but here's one thing to note. This is very important. 
the B penalty can never exceed what the A would have been. So if you had um, 200 employees and you were going to pay a penalty of $2,000 or $2, on each, you have a $4,000, you know, that's the limit that you, could, that you would have to pay. If, 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 you paid, if you took no action, you would have X number of, 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 of federal tax penalties. The B penalty can never accumulate to exceed what the A would have been. Okay. Another question. Is there a minimum number of employees for the law to apply? It, you, an employer, in order for the law to even apply to an employer, they must be defined as a large employer. And by definition, they must have in excess of 100 full-time employees on their payroll. And there's a, there's a very specific formula that tells you how to do that. Um, it is contained in many of our you know, webinars of the past. Um, but sh what I could do, Amanda, is I could include the slide um, from previous presentations that shows how to apply that formula to determine okay. if you're a large and small employer. Great. Does the 9.5% limit apply to gross wages, and does it apply only for coverage offered to the employee only? Very good question, and it's yes to both. Um, yes, it applies to gross wages. And, and, and again, the law, when it was written, it said that an employee could not pay greater than 9.5% of their household wages. Well, how in the world can an employer know what Johnny's household wages are? I mean, it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. So, so they they created a, a a safe harbor, and they said, okay, all right, fine. An you can use this. You can determine uh, affordability on the individual's W-2 wages, and the affordability test only has to apply to individual coverage. Okay. So I think that offers answers that question. I think so. Okay. Now I have, if my head count is below 100 on December 31st, 2014, I escape ACA penalties. Do I not need to account for temps that worked for short periods of time during 2014 but are no longer working for me? No. If you do the large employer test and that's the that is a formula that's different than the look back this there's a very specific formula to determine are you a large or small employer if you apply that formula to your payroll and you conclude that you are under 100 full-time employees you will be under 100 full-time employees for the entire year of 2015 I would suggest that if you go through and you apply this formula and you determine that you are less than 100 full-time employees, I would suggest pouring yourself a big glass of wine and uh, enjoy. <laughs> that's what I would do, <laughs> but that's not maybe the way everybody rolls. But uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, 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 there's only you only get tested once. If you're deemed to be a small employer, you're a small employer for the next 12 months. If you're deemed to be a large employer and you lost half your business uh, at, at, in February, you would still be considered a large employer for the remainder of 2015 regardless. So there's a, okay. there's a positive and a negative edge to that one-time test or annual test, if you will. So then every year you should reassess if you're at that 100 or more? Absolutely, absolutely. And in most of the software systems out there today, as I understand it, well, let me, I shouldn't say that, many of them have not only the tracking of employees, but also this calculation to determine if you, in fact, are a, well, I and mean, you could run your, you know, run your ACA uh, tracking report, if you will, on, on many of these software systems. Um, and, and in a case of Tricom, you guys are, what, you know, you guys have that feature to determine okay. if someone is a full-time employee. You're tracking that. Right. Okay. All right. Would the current plan that our employees purchase through you guys fall still fall under the definition of not a MEC plan, 
or is the plan now acceptable through 2015? It is clearly not. It is, it is not an MEC plan. It is not an ACA compliant plan. But interestingly enough, the plan that we offer is, is being consumed at a record rate. And, it, and a lot of that has to do with, first of all, it, it, it delivers great value. I mean, it's first dollar coverage, no deductibles, no copayments. You know, there's a lot of benefits to it. So I, I won't go down that road. But the most important thing, and this is where we see the growth, not only just of our plan, but fixed indemnity products in general. Employees are going to go to these exchanges. They're going to buy the least expensive plan because that's what people do. And in the process of buying the least expensive bronze plan, they're going to have the highest out-of-pocket expenses associated with any of the plans. So when Johnny realizes that while he has great catastrophic coverage, he's still going to be responsible for the first $5,000 of -of out-of-pocket expenses, he's going to look to an indemnity product to help him use as a gap product to cover those out-of-pocket expenses. That's going to be the trend. No question about it. Because I've often said, if you make $9 an hour, and you have a five thousand dollar deductible, it might as well be five million because you don't have five thousand. Okay. And is there a resource where they can find the formula to qualify as a large employer? Absolutely. And that was the slide that you were going to provide to me. I can provide that to you, but uh, those of you that are AS, ASP members, um, you know, they're on their health care well, white papers. They they cover this very extensively, um, but I can. Um, Amanda provides you with the slide that that covers that formula. It's uh, it's actually very simple. Uh, and okay. I won't I won't burden you with it right now, but it is very simple to apply. Yeah, that'd be great. And then I will email it out to all of the attendees today so that you have that for reference. Perfect, perfect. Um, any other questions out there? We certainly want to answer them while we're uh, here as a group that others could benefit from the answers. I don't have anything else that has come in at the moment. Did you have any other final comments or thoughts um, that might be helpful to share with the audience today? Um, had you some know, great I, questions. Well, we have had some great questions, and I appreciate it. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, again, I guess in wrap-up, uh, we don't profess to have all the answers. Um, I don't know if there is such a thing as a perfect solution, uh, but we're certainly working diligently to help our clients uh, avoid uh, or minimize the tax penalties associated with this law. Um, those of you that do not have relationships with, with insurance professionals, and, 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 and particularly those that have experience in the staffing industry, uh, we'd welcome that opportunity. Um, I guess that's Great. it. Great. Well, I have um, put the contact information up on your screen, um, Alan is a great resource. Um, Essential Staff Care is a great resource for information on ACA. Um, you know, certainly feel free to reach out to them if you have additional questions or looking for more information that would be specific to your needs. Mm-hmm. I will um, follow up today's presentation with an email to everyone. I'll attach the um, slides for, for you guys to look at, as well as the additional handouts that Alan will be providing to us. Can so, I uh, just one when, yeah. when you're doing that, I want to, everybody just to keep in mind, I'm going to be, I'm I'm getting married this weekend, so um, I'm going to be enjoying uh, a, a out of country honeymoon, and so I'll be out of pocket for a few days. So, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, while you send me emails between now and the ninth of June, um, you will be directed to one of my uh, one of my colleagues for assistance. No problem. Thank you for sharing that with us. I hope you have a fantastic wedding and honeymoon. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Great. So, again, you know, with that, um, I did put up a poll, so please give us your feedback. It's very helpful to us. Um, I'd like to really thank everyone for their participation um, in today's webinar, as well as all the the questions that came in today. Um, And certainly, Alan, for sharing your. vast amount of knowledge on the AC topic. Uh, we'll have a recording of today's presentation available on our website um, for a future reference if you wanted to hear it again or share it with others. Um, again, if you have any questions, you can reach out to myself or Alan, and we'd be happy to get back to you with that. Um, and look for more information on our next webinar session, which will be held on June 26th, and it is regarding uh, social science, a social media webinar. 
Um, so with that, I um, hope you guys have a fantastic afternoon, and we look forward to talking with you soon. Thank you. Thank you.